Hi, everybody. So if anybody wants to take a seat over at the edge here, you're welcome to. Welcome. So I'm really pleased on behalf of Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum to welcome you here on Governor's Island. It is the last weekend of our exhibition, Graphic Design, now in production. And we have an amazing group of designers today who are going to talk about their work and consider the state of design this weekend and this moment in history. So the event is called Graphic Design, The Final Hours. And among other things, we will consider the death of some of the world's great logo types. Um, <laughs> we will look at um, new generations of designers and new media and old media um, and kind of celebrate what it is that we do and think about how much longer it might last. Um, so our speakers today are the Stone Twins who are launching their, the second edition of their legendary book, Logo R.I.P. Um, and after the event, there will be a book signing and you can get a copy of the book and get twin signatures on it, which is great. Then Elliot Earls is here from Cranbrook. Uh, Keetra Dean Dixon and J.K. Keller will be following Elliot, the next generation. Um, Alicia Chang and Sarah Gephardt from Management Design here in New York. And finally, Daniel, Daniel Van Der Velden from Metahaven will conclude the event. The format is Pecha Kucha, which um, is a, if you haven't seen it before, you're in for a, an experience. Um, Pecha Kucha is a format in which each participant has 20 slides that automatically play for 20 seconds each. This prevents any one participant from hogging the afternoon. Um, it creates tension and surprise. There are moments where 20 seconds seems like the longest amount of time in the world. And of course, there's time when it just seems very, very short. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and as an audience, um, be patient and um, send good thoughts to the speakers as they struggle with the Pecha Kucha format. <laughs> so I'm not gonna make any further introductions. I'm gonna invite the amazing Stone Twins up on stage here, and we will launch the event. And thank you all for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. We're the Stone Twins. I'm Garrick, and this is Declan. And we're Hello. here today to talk about our book, Logo or IP, which is a commemoration of 50 defunct logotypes. Many of these logotypes are design classics or icons of their time. I was supposed to press that, I think, 10 seconds ago. Um, yeah, there's 50 logos in the book. Because of limited time today, we're only going to talk about nine, nine marks. Um, the core thesis of this book is logos, you know, um, part of a visual culture are lost. So, you know, it's, it's also commemoration, but it, all, it, it is also a theme of preservation with this book. So the first one up today is the Speedbird. This was the symbol of BOAC Airlines, which later morphed into British Airways. The symbol was created in 1929 by a famed poster artist called Lee Elliott, and it endured for right up until the mid-80s. Yeah, yeah. This was uh, yeah, created in the, in the 20s. But it was visualized and it was on a Concorde, a plane of the future, supersonic. Um, us as kids, we're from Ireland, we're from Dublin. And um, yeah, one of our first flights was British Airways. And this is, I remember walking up the steps, seeing that, because it was, it was at the front of the plane. And this one, of course, Kodak, recent loss. This is uh, obviously a K for Kodak. But it also evokes uh, the reflecting lens of a camera or a flash. So I think the simplicity yeah, makes it a really strong logo. And unfortunately, this was binned or trashed about six years ago. Very simply, Garrick, it's a Kodak moment. That's what it, that's what it is to me. It's a, it's a holiday of no. 
36 snaps. For the, the younger people probably don't know, but the old days you had strips of film and you only could take 36 picks. That's what it meant to me. Really? Well, this is a design classic and this is from our hometown, Ireland. Dublin, Ireland. It's the, the symbol of the national telephone company, Telecom Erin. And as you can see, it's a, it's a perfect marriage of international style with the Celtic ornamentation that's um, characteristic of pre-Christian. Dating point. Yeah. Sometimes you were lucky. Sometimes she showed up, sometimes she didn't. Um. And you never know. NASA, well, what can we say about this? You know, great logos always have great nicknames. So this is called The Worm, created in 1974 by Dane and Blackburn. And I think it's just so I supremely elegant and refined. I think the way the letters are simplified to their, their essential forms, and it evokes technology, precision. Really, really easy to draw. Um, okay. if, you, if you looked back at our <laughs> copy books and school books as kids, covered in logos, generally the, the, the NASA logo. Um, there was a time with a space shuttle in the 80s. Um, we had the Airfix kit. Yeah, it was, it's just cool cool logo this is not really a cool logo but it's a, it's <laughs> it's a great logo um that endured for over 70 years i don't know if you're familiar with this car brand in the states but this is for rover cars and rover itself means wayfarer or explorer so hence the um the the longship the viking longship so it's quite an unusual mark that represented uh, this brand of cars that was the car of the middle classes and even ministerial power in Britain. That, that, that for years had uh, Japanese cars, mostly Toyotas, and yeah, mid-80s he got a Rover and it was like, wow, we're moving on in life. And it was a real status thing. Head, heads, turned, <laughs> heads turned when you had a Rover. British Petroleum. Uh, yeah, being Irish, we always loved this, of course. Um, yeah, the heraldic crest just evokes power, strength, uh, part of the empire, and this endured from, yeah, stylistically durable for, it lasted for over 70 years. Yeah, this meant a pit stop or a wee wee stop. Um, when daddy needed to refuel, it was yeah, a time to get a chalk ice as well and a bag of crisps. And <laughs> um, you're on the way somewhere, somewhere wet in the west of Ireland. And yeah, this is fond memories of this. Pan Am, of course. Um, yeah, this is just an iconic logo, created in 1958. Just a perfect circle, <coughs> interspersed with parabolic lines to convey global roots of uh, the romantic jet age. And yeah, who would have, you know, a world without Pan Am was just unimaginable. What's incredible with this mark is it's just been immortalized in probably, yeah, probably two of the best science fiction movies, 2001 and Blade Runner, and yeah, wow, you know, cool. Um, it's in loads of great movies. It was in the first um, Willy Wonka movie, and it was in National Lampoon's Solis. European uh, Vacation. <laughs> Transamerica, this is uh, Don Irvine from 1967, and yeah, you can see it in the form. It's a, it's a modernist form, but it implies um, expansive growth, which is perfectly appropriate for a, a massive conglomerate. So during the 60s and 70s, Transamerica just owned airlines, uh, budget rent a car, and United Artists uh, Film Studios. Yeah, this one, um, I know as an animation, it was blue on a black background, and it went up, and then it went out. And yeah, what it meant was uh, a late night, mum and dad said you could stay up late, you had your popcorn, and James Bond. <laughs> and UPS, yeah, Paul Rand, favorite. So we're, we're gonna end on this, and I think this, represents everything for us about a great logo. I think just the simplicity of, of strokes and um, yeah, despite the fact that it was created in 1961, it still yeah, endures today. Um, but yeah, for obvious reasons, it was, it was binned. Uh, it, th this is Paul Rand here, and um, there's a lo lovely anecdote to, to this uh, logo when he was developing it. He asked his eight-year-old daughter um, what she saw, and she said, Daddy, I see a present. And um, I think that's our point today about, about logos. I think um, there's questions of, of, of um, form, of you know, um, how it looks, but logos are stories. Logos are human. Lo logos have wit, and um, a lot of the marks Paul made um, have this, and this is what we love, it. his logos, the humanity. Thanks very much.
Hello. <coughs> no, I think I got it. Are we ready to go? Uh, I have five posters and one object in the exhibition downstairs. I thought I might take my six minutes to deal with some of the issues I see present in the work. Uh, 20 seconds per slide is uh, pretty quick, so out of necessity, I'll be exceedingly brief and uh, hopefully to the point. That's one of those awkward pauses <laughs> that I've heard so much about. Am I supposed to hit the button? Okay. Um, a traditional approach to this uh, project would have been to describe or embody each of the 10 departments uh, in its respective poster. Oh. Okay, sorry, sorry. I won't hit the button. I won't hit the button again. I won't hit the button again. <laughs> the work on display was actually part of a larger set of 11 uh, posters. The posters were rec recruiting material for the grad program at Cranbrook Academy of Art. Uh, there are 10 departments at Cranbrook, so I designed uh, one for each department and one for the larger academic uh, program. I just didn't know whether it had started yet, honestly. So a traditional approach to this project would have been to describe or to embody each of the 10 departments in its respective poster. Um, in other words, the sculpture department's poster would capture something essential about the actual sculpture department at Cranbrook. I, I rejected this approach. <coughs> I wanted to avoid uh, this kind of solution. I felt it was familiar and didactic. So in lieu of this approach, I wanted the entire set to pose a kind of aesthetic question. Rather than provide information, I wanted the aesthetics of the work to be problematic. Over the course of my career, the ideas in my work have been linguistically uh, derived. In the poster uh, on the screen from 1995, the pictorial space of the piece was derived directly from the text, The Conversion of St. Paul. Uh, the form deals with uh, conversion as a metaphor for spiritual, uh, religious, and intellectual transformation. Uh, that type of approach was fundamentally different from what was available to me in this design problem. Here, I had no rich language to tie the ideas back to. Uh, here, we have the word painting. And again, rather than describe or embody, my goal became to link these images uh, subconsciously to the power of the id, and I'm going to discuss how in the next slides. Our contemporary culture is a kind of pornotopia. Our media culture is dripping with the aesthetics of human sexuality. Uh, the animalistic power of sexual desire is leveraged in our culture to fuel um, our desire to consume. Explicit sexuality is literally everywhere. Uh, as the design process developed and as the work emerged, I attempted to infuse these graphics with a kind of glistening dynamism and Dionysian power that marks the aesthetics of sex while specifically removing uh, literal sexuality. I wanted uh, this work to be about the fetishized body, the surface and texture of desire, but I wanted this characteristic to be latent uh, not overt. I wanted to remove the explicit and leave the echo. If you look hard enough, I think you could draw a connection to the work of Bruce Weber. I think it's also possible to see a conceptual connection uh, to the work of George O'Keefe. Uh, and within our pornographically saturated culture, I like to think that you could also triangulate any number of cultural vectors from American apparel uh, to the abject nature of consumer culture as a whole. My strategy became to engage the id, the dark, inaccessible part of our personality, remove explicit uh, sexuality and pose an aesthetic question. Uh, I'm going to try to address my tactics uh, how I approached the process on a formal level. The first tactic was to construct paradoxical pictorial spaces. Put as simply as possible, I wanted 
uh, to seamlessly composite elements that on first blush inhabit a believable pictorial space, but in the physical world uh, are incompatible. I wanted to commingle things like axonometric perspective with extreme wide angle perspective. I composited real photographic objects with computationally derived objects and composited um, hand-drawn objects uh, slipping into the photographic. Uh, conceptually, this work is primarily about a concern for flesh, sex, sweat, hair, secretion, and the look of tactility. Conceptually, the work is aesthetic uh, and therefore became as much about craft, physical laws, uh, and the nature of pictorial space. I set the table for this discussion uh, by seemingly calling into question the pornotopia that our culture has become. Yet this work is steeped in its formal surfaces and draws uh, on the fetishized aesthetics of commoditized sex. So is this work then critical or uh, celebratory? And how does this work serve the goals of the client, Cranbrook Academy of Art? One model for artistic practice sees work as a conceptual test bed and an ethical safe zone. In this model, as retrograde as this may sound, the practitioner's only responsibility is to use the work to interrogate the world around him and then use the work as a reflection of that effort. As a way of concluding my talk, uh, I'd like to briefly address where I think this kind of work for me leads. I see medium as irrelevant to the real task at hand, poster, installation, discrete sculptural object, the form is immaterial. The medium is the objectification of understanding. It's the formal residue of an intellectual, spiritual, and technical process. For me, the goal has always been the relentless, qu uh, relentless quest for more powerful representation. My goal has been to move the viewer with the work, regardless of its form. My goal has been to breathe life into work and to make it a powerful social agent. Design process and methodology is a set of tools in service of this task. Thank you very much. Check, check. There you go, like that. Okay. So, I'm JK. I'm Keitra. Uh, and um, we've been partners since about 2006, uh, actually exactly 2006. Um, and we're still trying to articulate what it means to be a collaborative us rather than a sort of individual you and me. Um, and so our current working method is to work side by side and together, um, which allows us indirect influence in the short term, but long term we're trying to do more collaborative stuff. So independently, um, my, much of my work uh, 
is the result of direct manipulations of default settings and uh, appropriative materials to attempt to create new form. Uh, so mountains are computationally flattened, things like that. And I do a lot of typographic or slogan-esque work. Um, I also create a lot of objects or platforms that encourage absurd interactions. So the upper right-hand corner, that's the anonymous hugging wall. The lower left-hand corner is an excerpt uh, from the objects of codependency. Um, and out of these sort of independent practices, uh, we've generated a few core working methodologies uh, or methods and, um, you know, they often attempt to attain a similar end result, but the differences in voice uh, is kind of where, you know, we keep our individuality and then hopefully, you know, at the crossroads of these things is where the magic happens. Um, and, you know, though the longer that we work together, um, and side by side, the more our work kind of blends into its own little thing. And most people would say it's where the lines don't intersect is where the real magic is supposed to happen. Um, and so we're working on that. But one of our most uh, intuitive and probably biggest areas of overlap is this practice that we call breaking. Um, and since it's such a major part of our practice, we've uh, formulated a more strategic approach of using breaking as research and development. Um, so we recently started started this online archive that presents our ongoing uh, material misuses and tool breaking. Um, and the first level of the studies that we do, we call attempts because often they don't seem to lead anywhere productive. Here's some examples, uh, JK in the upper left trying to draw a straight line with a scanner. Um, I'm in the bottom right hand corner uh, making a drawing machine using a vacuum and inked ball bearing. But uh, often we run across studies that do lead to more productive outputs. Um, so here I was doing uh, these type extrusion exercises, forcing material through typographic templates. And I was hoping to kind of create a flip between controlled intentional messages and a loss of that linguistic meaning as new form unfurls. And I had previously been working on these typographic experiments called doublespeak. So strengthening or shifting the meaning of words by creating the letter forms out of the extrusion of smaller letters. So here uh, we have truth in words uh, and achieve and explore. Um, and then uh, in 2011, we were commissioned by Jennifer Daniel uh, to do a spread for a good magazine. Um, and we thought that, the f uh, well, the focus of the issue was work or working today. And we thought that our like uh, kind of cross, pa cross, cross paths of typographic extrusions would be a really good place to sort of focus our work on this. Oh, and zip forward. This is actually, wi we decided to use this device and JK uh, wrote the initial JavaScripting that utilized the blend tool in Illustrator. On the left-hand side are examples of what that code produced computationally. He, he taught me how to use the tool and then I hacked it a little bit, produced those, finessed the final um, form, and I'm a little behind. But the final output, um, we utilized the word mistake to make amazing. So uh, we're both, we both like to work with not only uh, interesting misuses of communication, but also entertaining misuses of technology. Um, and recently I began collaborating with Siri on the iPhone on a poetry project. Um, and hopefully this sound will work. Uh, it doesn't say anything yet, but uh, at the top. Um, so it's really good at translating text or speech into text, um, uh, but not so good at other things. And so I was curious, what if you fed it scat, uh, nonsense words, or uh, you know other uh, sounds? <laughs> Right, so after this initial test, uh, Keetra and I discussed like how we could you know, move it forward and we produ to produce a series of publications and posters um, that sort of act as another misinterpreted feedback loop. Um, so the first one is a 46 minute performance of Kurt Schwitter's uh, sound poem, The Ursinate, um, and then putting all her translation back into the original Jan Tischhold design, which you see there. 
Okay, next project. So um, JK and I have been doing this series of dimensional typographic work since 2008. And I came up with the original idea behind how to the process for creating the series when I was trying to think like JK. So we end up obsessing over something physically by hand, um, literally layering material onto letter forms. And the material that we chose to do this layering was wax, as you can see here. So when we were invited to do the uh, work for the show downstairs, uh, we ordered 400 pounds of wax. And I built this elaborate layering station in our kitchen. I mean, overly elaborate. Uh, and then uh, it kind of turned our kitchen into this waxy wonderland. And so we started layering, and we got to work, and just layering, and layering, and layering, and every night. Even our dogs had yeah. wax on them. It was yeah. crazy. Uh, and then three weeks later, we kind of finished these sort of larger works. Um, we'll see it in action here. Oh, in two yeah, seconds. there's an animation. So, and I actually have a real problem controlling my curiosity. And since the work for the show we knew was going to be a very large one and take a long time to develop, I was scared I wouldn't be able to prevent myself from cutting into the layers to get a sneak peek. So we actually developed these little test mounds that I could interstitially slice into. Um, but those little guys only gave us a vague idea of what was going on in the larger piece. So basically we just had to um, resist the urge, or I did, until the piece got to its enormous big enough size. And then we opened up this giant hinge and sliced the sucker open and shaved it down. And drum roll. <laughs> And here's the final piece. And hopefully you guys have been able to check it out downstairs. So at the left is one of the test segments from the piece at the right, which is downstairs. Um, big question is usually how much does it weigh? It's about 150 pounds as an end result. Yeah. Um, and we'd just like to say, you know, we doubly thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's the final slide. There, doubly thank you. <laughs> is well familiar with this slide. <laughs> um, well, thank you for coming on this beautiful day. I'm Alicia Chang, this is Sarah Gephardt, Sarah. and together we should say this in, in unison, we are management design. design. <laughs> um, so after we met in graduate school, we came together and formed management uh, before the band. And now we have a studio in Brooklyn with ourselves and two other designers. And today we want to talk about um, process on a more practical level. How, what happens after the initial phone call to what it becomes as graphic design as we know it, which is that little guy there. The interstitial process is very messy, convoluted, not as straightforward as one would idealize in the, um, you know, maybe when you're in school. So we want to start talking about uh, the project we did for Al Gore, which is also downstairs today. Um, it's, this is a slide from his original presentation from An Inconvenient Truth. Um, so we were tasked with creating the book in uh, four months in order to time with the premiere, which was an incredibly accelerated kind of process normally for a book. So we were given all of his original PowerPoint slides. And in terms of process, you know, a lot of people ask what it was like to work with Al, like Sarah and I in a room with Al just hanging out. But it ended up being much more complex. Um, it required a huge SWAT team of people from the packager, which is Meltra Media, the publisher, which is Rodale, Al's team, which was extensive, and us, which sort of grew, grew to sort of swallow the studio. So these are just um, some thumbnails of the whole book in general. Um, you know, it's like a die cut cover. We ended up redesigning all the infographics from his original um, keynote presentation. There's a very pointed picture of he and Tipper there, which I find kind of sad right now. Um, but the sense of the book and trying to capture that sort of visceral presentation of his original slideshow was kind of a task at hand. This is actually from his second book that we did with him called Our Choice, which is a pretty different mandate. But we included this because um, as an infographic, it somehow got airtime on Conan O'Brien on The Tonight Show when Al was being interviewed. And Conan really got off on the fact that like that cat is bigger than the car. And then you yeah, could hear the, like, the whole studio audience laughing. Got it was like, laughed. Oh my yeah. God. 
So this is some research material for a project we did called Intelligent Cities with the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. So this initiative, the mandate was to, uh, what's the formal t fr phrase, was sort of corralling the amount of information out there to help people learn more about their everyday lives. So that was a pretty big mandate, and you know we wanted to help kind of shape how they were going to present it to the public. And we started with the identity. This went through a lot of iterations about different ways to um, sort of formalize a logo that's based on data. So it ended up being this sort of pixelized topography that sort of grows like a metropolis. Um, and you then the speak whole to the idea of data and what a, an urban environment was. Right. Um, this process then was more like a sort of tennis match where it was sort of the volley where we would start an idea and then the National Building Museum would respond and would just sort of be this ongoing dialogue for each um, iteration. The nature of this project had um, six ads in Time Magazine, so we helped uh, work collaboratively with the curators to figure out a strategy for these ads, sort of like a powers of ten idea where it was started with the individual and grow, expand outwards towards, you know, your country in your community. Um, so these are some examples of what ended up being developed. You know, we wanted to sort of shape it through a question. We're racing right along. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> now we're on to Google. And uh, when they first called, we were so excited, as one would naturally be, thinking it would be a wonderful long-term relationship with, like, lots of money, and we got free lunches every time we met with them. And so, I mean, that was really fun. But um, we included this as a good example of, you know, where the client may be totally high level and everything is great in that respect. It was incredibly agonizing. And here we just show there was 15 versions, but it really went on for much, much longer than that. It's about um, a year project. Well, when it was supposed to be four weeks, yeah. which was the kind of the killer. So it just sort of went on and on. The nature of the, they wanted us to create a data visualization that basically illustrated a timeline of web browsers. So, but that also was, uh, they had tons Chrome of data was sets. just coming out at the time. Right, but they didn't want to really say it was for Chrome. It was like, you know, a history of data browsers. And oh, hey, here's Chrome. It really happens to encompass everything that's awesome about the internet. Um, so these are just some versions where you can see it was like vertical, it was horizontal. They didn't know what they wanted it for, which was hard. So this ended up being the final uh, product, even though, you know, there was a billion iterations before that. So technically it is a timeline with, you know, coding history and web browsers sort of coming to this great confluence at the end. Um, but yeah, it just sort of does not necessarily reveal the ag agony that preceded it. Um, which brings us to lunch. At the office, we have uh, a communal lunch, and we just talk about a bunch of different things. And after Google, I think especially, we were kind of like, why are we waiting for people to call us with good ideas when we should be our own client? So we talk often about different kind of facts that make us all wonder about different contexts from a data information uh, standpoint. So that spawned a whole series of self-generated infographics, of which um, this is one of them. May when the volcano interrupted in Iceland, everyone was talking about that huge seismic occurrence. But we were like, how does this relate, you know, to the ten biggest eruptions? It's actually really puny. And then sort of how that correlates with, you know, different uh, main population locations. So for us, it was an opportunity to sort of better understand certain conditions, like Mitt Romney's net worth, for example, how that would stack up. To turns out, George Washington was totally like the big daddy of presidential candidates. Um, and JFK not far behind. And, you know, again, it's all contextually relevant from an economic standpoint, but for us, it was sort of a way to visualize how that worked out compared to, say, Barack Obama. And, you know, UFOs, how do you classify a UFO? So that was a whole another rabbit hole that we were happy to go down to in terms of, you know, determining what the classifications were for each shape. Um, you know, this guy named Hynek created the scale, but that's in dispute with UFOologists, which is an actual thing. Um, then the next one, I think, oh, for the Olympics, we were just talking about all the sort of crazier sports that were once included in Summer Olympics, like uh, polo and tug of war. Um, and, you know, who knew that ice skating debuted in the Summer Olympics? Little known fact. Um, but things like that kind of like excite us in terms of just sort of finding out more about a field that you don't necessarily know. Um, I want to end with this, you know, as a nod to NASA from the first presentation, because um, we're pretty into that whole aesthetic, too. This one was notable because we got a query from NASA, um, somebody named Joe Bibby, but the best part about that email was that his signature read, lead of the media strike team. <laughs> so that is the last slide, and thank you very much.
Hello. Um, okay, so we're waiting for the Metahaven. This is not the first slide, sorry. <laughs> I hope that won't be deducted from like 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so it starts now. Okay, this is a quote from Alan Lupton from the catalog. Few collectives have achieved more notoriety than the Amsterdam-based partnership Metahaven. That notoriety is the state of being known for some unfavorable actor quality. <laughs> Later, Alan um, commented that she meant that notori notoriety means no noteworthiness with an edge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a book that we did a while ago, Uncorporate Identity, and I, I guess that, that the, the title of that book speaks to, speaks to our deep distrust, uh, love-hate relationship with design and with identity uh, in particular. Um, so uh, the book is really a collection of work, and it's illuminated by essays by um, many people, including ourselves. Um, and the first case study in the book is uh, an identity we designed for the Principality of Sealand. And the Principality of Sealand is this sort of rare, weird mini-state that was declared on a, on a man-made island in the North Sea. Uh, and that really got us started thinking about the relationship between like, things like design and um, you know, geopolitics, things like that. So one of our efforts for Sealand was coming up with sort of new business models by which they could sort of revive their, their nation state. And one of these business models was an engagement with NATO. Um, at the time that was partially real, but it was also very largely speculative. So this is the island. Yeah, <laughs> as if you don't, didn't know that. And this is, was a, mo uh, a model that we created for the Sealand website that never, never really got about, and we called it the Information Monument at that time, uh, with the idea that uh, complexity on the internet is the new simplicity. The idea that uh, with Google, you know, you get the sort of uh, search, don't sort paradigm, which is really a kind of inversion of, of, the, of the traditional idea of graphic order. Then uh, also there's quite some writing in the book. This is a letter that we wrote to the Prince of Sealand uh, titled Everything Means Nothing, uh, at the time inspired by Alicia Keys. And um, so the, all that is part of our design process basically. So, uh, part of the, the making, uh, like writing, and all these things are, are, are basically one thing for us. Uh, this is a Sealand Noble title. One of one part of their business model is that they distribute noble titles th that are for sale, and we happen to know someone who who basically had one of these titles, uh, and she got that title uh, as a present from a friend. Uh, and in the book, we mapped the trajectory that 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 noble title had. So the friend was the the, the bass player of uh, of the band Friends Ferdinand. Uh, with another interesting relationship with royalty in the name, of course, and uh, uh, he's the boyfriend of her sister, and he gave her for for her birthday, he gave her this noble title. So uh, that's the way that Sealand tried to survive, and that's also the way how they ultimately died. So uh, the the rise and fall of the Data Haven is one article where we interview one of the sort of hacker personalities, uh, uh, cipher. Uh, punks who basically try to uh, make money from Sealand and failed. Uh, and this has inspired a long-running interest and involvement with sort of radical internet politics on, on our behalf. Uh, so we, we quite identify with the libertarian ideals of the internet. Um, this is another piece in the book, uh, Transnistria, an unrecognized state in the geopolitical world order. It was kind of our dream that, that a Russian geographer would write about Transnistria in a design book. And Transnistria is basically this completely unrecognized and illegitimate but fu fully functioning state between uh, Ukraine and Moldova. Sheriff is his national football team as well as its biggest supermarket chain. So there is a complete sort of hyper, it's an interesting sort of hyper-capitalist fabric that is completely entwined with, with sort of fo former communist ideas of author state authority. So it's really a kind of quite advanced sort of state model that they're running there. Sometimes the book morphs into something that looks more like a fanzine and sometimes it, uh, it, it goes from sort of from one state to another. So we treated one particular political theorist to a sort of fanzine treatment of her text. Uh, and then it morphs into, you know, yet another sort of form or incarnation of what, you know, content uh, can become. So what is uncorporate identity? Uh, this is an example, like you could say that uncorporate identity for us as a concept was very much inspired by the things that we saw happening during the sort of 
uh, war on terror and the enormous increase of secrecy powers on the behalf of the US government. Um, so for us, an uncorporate identity basically is the thing that you're going to see right now. This is a uh, rendition plane that was used by the CIA to fly um, captives of the war on terror around the globe without, you know, to these sort of extra, uh, extra legal prisons. And these c planes were completely unmarked. They were completely white. So the idea is that the most advanced identity at the moment is basically a kind of non-identity or a sort of stealth identity. Uh, one other uh, part uh, in the book, this particular chapter deals with what we call legacies of 9-11, and this, this, this is a sort of 3D black metal logo that we created in our, in our sort of endless uh, involvement with that music genre. Uh, and from, from that initially disconnected interest in, bl in black metal music, we uh, eventually found out that black metal was used as a torture music in Guantanamo Bay. And this, I mean, you can laugh about this, but this is part of a sort of ex uh, experimental punitive methods that were tried to like ex you know, extract information from these prisoners. So there is like, there's deep links between all these things that we find interesting, intriguing, and also worth mentioning. So eventually we came up with the comparison between black metal logos and internet captures. Um, uh, speaking to a sort of cult of eligibility, secrecy, and, 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 and encryption that, that maybe runs throughout, you know, through our culture. Uh, yeah. So the captures on the left, the black metal on the right, and of course in the graphic design now in production, there's also the guy who drew most of these logos is actually featured in the show. So it's a uh, so um, the last part of the book deals mostly with uh, the idea of uh, network power and the idea of you know new forms of association and linkage that basically take over. Uh, legitimacy in branding and brand states is one one article that that speaks to that and one sort of study that speaks to that. Um, consequently, you could say that we're moving from a, from an era of public relations to an era of social standards. We're we're moving from from um, let's say this sort of event to like Facebook and and social networks. Uh, and our re our recent and current work is very much concerned with that, both when we get commissioned and also when we uh, approach other people or you know or do so, so self-initiated, self-directed work. So forthcoming are two new books: "Can Jokes Bring Down Governments," an e-book, and "Black Transparency," an as yet again delayed book um, because of the the fact that the publishing industry is very much changing right now, as we know. And um, we we quit with our publisher and are still are are basically uh, trying to work with a new one right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so so we have time for a little bit of questions and conversation. Um, of course, we have no seats. So I'm going to invite the speakers to come up and stand with me. And some of you have been patiently waiting can occupy their wonderful chairs. <laughs> Relax for a few minutes. Thanks. And so we're going to um, kind of share the microphones and you guys can kind of pass them around and, and all of that. And we're going to be trying to capture any questions from the audience for our live web stream. Um, so I will be repeating questions um, for, that, for that purpose. And of course, the whole world will hear your question. So, so be aware of that before you ask something, especially um, personal or whatever. So I have, <laughs> it was a great presentation. I feel so inspired to, to be with all of you and so grateful that your work is in the show and it's, it's really um, fantastic. And, and so, so some of the themes that, that came up as you talked was, of course, branding and the death of branding and a critique of branding. Um, it, it strikes me that many of you have your own brand and, and some of you have insisted on a kind of individuality and kind of keeping your own identity as designers as opposed to being um, kind of framed in a brand. So I thought maybe there, there could be some comment about the kind of state of the designer today as a branded entity. Maybe the twins might speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> Their brand is the Stone Twins. I don't refer to them. This feels a bit like Guantanamo yeah. Bay. Yeah. 
All we need is some black metal music. And you were just like, clunk. Uh, I think essentially, uh, well, Declan and I are involved with the Design Academy in Eindhoven, and we always convey to our students that uh, the main equity that uh, young designers have these days is their autonomy. And their so unfortunately, we're living in a world where design is, well, it's not unfortunate, but it's just a, a fact because of the internet and because of the low cost of software, design has become completely democratic. So our mum, who's our special uh, guest here today, mm -hmm. she's even photoshopping family <laughs> images, you know? But if you've seen her sisters, it's probably a good thing. But <laughs> so I think in that con but, but in that context, I think uh, if you have something to say as a designer, that's really really important. So if that if some people interpret that as a as a brand, well, so be it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, would you like to speak to that? Yeah. <laughs> because like no i i think that it's all nice with autonomy and freedom and things like that but i think that the the the, the reality of design is that it has for always been uh, from 98 percent about complying with standards and i think that you know our the, our the our idea that we have this kind of authorship is is great but it's historically an anomaly rather than like an affirmation because like uh, graphic design has been tied to standardization of in every way. It's been first of all technological, second communication, writing, language. All these things have been you know the decisive forces that dri that sort of drove graphic design. So I think that uh, as much as we are developing our autonomy, we must be wary of not you know bec getting into the illusion that we are sort of almighty and that we have become sort of these kind of uh, you know these kind of uh, transcendental creative figures well yeah um, but i think there are multiple agendas that go on within work right i mean in, in the in the presentation that I, I gave i attempted to show that the subtext of the work and the aesthetic agenda could be quite a bit different than the overt textual agenda you know so, I mean, I think that uh, work operates on a number of different levels, um, and in the modernist canon, the issue of appropriateness is, uh, is, is very important. And as long as um, you have, I, th I believe as long as you have the respect and the trust of your client, and you work with them in a way where they know that you really do have their best interests uh, at heart. Yeah, um, I do. Um, and that you're attempting to really um, uh, solve a problem, um, the work can function on a number of different levels. Um, one where your own agency uh, in the subtext can be foregrounded. That's why, you know, not, not to belabor it, but the idea of posters that have like the word painting on them, well, what are you, what are you gonna do with that, you know, in terms of text? So uh, you can mine the subtext. Um, you can work on the, uh, the area below. Maybe. Yeah, I think it's an interesting comment because then I look back at our presentation, which was very much like, here's a piece we did for a client. And the client kind of like beat us up a lot. And it's like hard to retain that sense of not ownership per se, but sort of sense of your own in design integrity when you go through so many rounds with somebody that you really are sort of trying to come to a meeting point where your own aesthetic recommendations are something that they can accept and acknowledge and respect. So I think. Where we are in our studio and our practice, dealing with clients and trying to get to that point is a very critical way that we kind of take projects. So if it's somebody we can communicate with, that's already like a huge... Um, it yeah, might be a advantage. cliche, but I mean, everything is a collaboration, definitely with the clients and something like working on the Intelligent Cities with the National Building Museum, as we tried to show is that we really like working with them and they like working with us. And so is this happy relationship. And mm -hmm. so, and then we feel good about the work in the end. But it's hard to say where we en we begin and they <coughs> end and that the, what the division is. We're not forcing something on them. But, uh, can, can I just add, just to, just to clarify, I mean, Declan and I, we're not the, uh, completely deluded, but it's the sense that, um, yeah, the vast majority of our work is client-based. I think this book is, is, is exceptional because it just came from us. But I think just to, to answer what Daniel said, I think essentially um, you still need to have an individual spirit and that should infect or inspire your work um, because there's, t there's too much work out there that's very uniform and generic and maybe technically it's, it's superb but it doesn't have a, a soul or a, a sense of spirit 
And I think that's th that's what we like to to, to see, and, and that's what great work has. It should engage to a, an audience that's beyond this building, um, beyond design world. Just one, one quick thing, I know, I'm, I'm not, but uh, the, I think the point that you're bringing up is is right on, which is the idea. I mean, if you think about it in, in almost any other artistic discipline, and I consider design an art form, um, the notion in music of that. Um, Agency, the idea that the designer or the artist who has a kind of point of view, who does not fit in, right, has, has a kind of um, almost overt display of their own agency, regardless of how that, how that actually looks, is, I, I think, the, the sole prescription for success. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that work looks maximal or minimal. I think the, 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 the actual way that work looks is totally irrelevant. The, the issue is whether or not um, the work has a kind of unique point of view and that the agency of the designer is the thing that is, is, is critical within that. So in a lot of undergraduate education, I, I believe that what's actually, being, which actually, what's actually being taught to designers is this, this idea of appropriateness and this idea of fitting in. But if you think about success, and if you, th you think about success in any other field, and you then can transport that to our field, it has to do with point of view. It has to do with unique point of view. So it doesn't mean that the work needs to look like mine or, or look like yours. It just simply has to have that kind of um, unique quality. So you guys have not said anything. Oh, it's funny. I, do, I think the body of work that we actually showed today, it's, it's self-authored. Um, and I actually, it, it, it is very much about approaching uh, this starting point and setting up a collaborative process with material or tool. Um, so in that, when I work with a client, it, I, to, it falls very much in line with management's perspective that it's a, a, the a final output is the direct relationship of the success of the collaborative efforts. Um, so it's, I, I think the body of work that we actually showed um, doesn't represent in visual final form uh, how I feel about my graphic design practice with clients involved, which it's a different. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that good? <laughs> yeah, thanks. So I'd like to take a couple questions from the audience if anybody has a, um, a thought or, yes, thank you. The, the royal titles from Sealandia, do they still exist? Um, <laughs> I think you might still be able to get them. But you know they they they've been like they're like a, a like a sort of bad currency at the moment. I guess that like there's so many of them that just is quite <laughs> it's quite an inflated currency. I, I guess, but I'm sure I can get you one. <laughs> <laughs> Only designers though can have one. Any other questions? That's great. It's uh, for Daniel, but maybe it can extend to everyone else too. But I know MetaHaven sort of positions themselves as a design research studio, and I'm curious what the relationship or the process of research and making is like. Um, like, do you have an idea in mind, and then you want to research that, or is it sort of more reciprocal? So I just need to restate the question that, that is about research, and how do you define that process um, in your firm, MetaHaven? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think that initially for us research came along because to not get bored with design so there was something you know it needs design needs to be sort of infused with other things in order to stay interesting i feel like the design in and for itself is not even so interesting so it became and then of course we had to go and think about oh hey we don't really have any academic credentials you know we don't have any sort of well described method for what we're doing so i would say that finding out what the position of research is in our work and in in wor like work in general um, is really um, constantly changing. I have to say, like I, I must feel, I feel that you know, part part of, part of our work is still uh, kind of rooted in in a sort of in a kind of individualism in the sense that we sometimes want to make what we want to make. We don't want to think about, hey, does it fit to our research? Sometimes what you want to make is just is sort of not reason at all. It's something that you do like f from the gut, not really from like a preconceived research position. But then. For example, to get to new projects. Uh, for us, it's sometimes very important that we do a fair bit of research before we do our first sort of step into a sort of new field. So then we, it's also just a way to, to get, you know, to get to design, at least for ourselves, that is sort of a little bit, that's sometimes better informed. Also because we deal with topics that are sort of non, 
non yeah non conventional or they're they're not like discussed every day in the graphic design context and they're sometimes not client based so for, yeah uh, but you know to get to a sort of well defined methodology in in design research you know it would have to become something well, I mean it would be great if that's possible as long as it doesn't become sort of bloodless and sort of boring and predictable that would be yeah but maybe other people should speak to this as well. I mean, you can call it research, but there's many people who do, you know, you know, who gather, you know, c collect knowledge, work with knowledge, you know, like you, you guys showed. Yeah, I, I'd find it incredible that you, um, you would become bored with, with design. That, um, I, I didn't say that. I said that design by itself yeah. is boring. But I think design f for everyone here, design is, is just a tool. If, y if you've nothing t to say, um the design only have something to say if that's Nike, if that's for one person, and design is just a method of of answering that brief. So if the brief is for yourself or for a million people, that's just design. That was true in the yeah. sort of that's advertising like, that's age, like but that's no longer true in the age of Facebook. Yeah, so I would just ask the question, Daniel, um, are you a designer or are you an artist? And could you distinguish those two titles? Um. I would rather have a much wider choice of options yeah. than <laughs> just designer <laughs> artist. <laughs> um, I could think of a few other words, but probably inappropriate. <laughs> okay, any, anybody else from the audience? Be, be scared, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> follow up, my friend. Um, I'll, I'll prove this by saying this is not like a loaded or a confrontational question. I really want to Which means answer. it's going to be <laughs> no, 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 no. It, that's all how you take it. But you said um, design in itself is not interesting. Then why are you a designer? No, keep it. It was more about keeping it interesting. Like, like um, um, I feel awkward with the microphone. I know. With the microphone. I Daniel, we're trying to capture this for the entire world for Facebook and everything. <laughs> right. right. Okay. Sorry. No, it's a good question. So it's also about, um, um, I mean, the designers that, that we find, you know, that we admire are people who've been looking at, who are basically in, interested in things and they use design as a way to be about these things. So they don't, use, they don't use design as something that's an end in itself. They use design as a way to be about the world. And that's what we, what we find inspiring designers. And that doesn't need to be like super political or that doesn't need to look like our work or whatever. It can look like anything. But that's the thing that, that drives um, interesting design for us. So maybe it was a sort of little bit of a provocative statement to say like, okay, design is you know, bad or it's boring. It is boring if it's, it's, not, infu if it's not infused. And you know, the client can be the, infu can, can be the thing that infuses design. You know, that can be the thing that makes it about the world, but it can also be other things. It can be research, it can be uh, speculation, you know, it can be many different things. Um, that's why I don't believe personally in a sort of future for design without clients. I don't believe in that, that story in general. Can I just say that there's a great quote from uh, Tibor Kalman. And he once said that um, there's an design is not a means in itself, but it's, hold on a sec. It's, not <laughs> backwards. it's what? <laughs> it's not an end in it, so. That's the one, yeah. It's a means to an end. <laughs> Except perhaps these are the final hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody else from the audience? Yes, back here. I heard it was inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, but I couldn't see it. <laughs> I know, well, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think Obama's campaign looks pretty good. <laughs> Anybody else want to take that on? I I'll, I'll just speak to, the, to uh, what Sarah said, that um, there's been a lot of articles and a lot of uh, people talking about the design of the Obama campaign, especially uh, the 2008 campaign. So um, yeah, people take it seriously and 